So now we want to move towards generalizing some of the results from the last lecture. So in the last lecture, we talked about this case where we have a bar in compression and make a cut at 45 degrees. And we describe the forces, the normal forces and the shear forces acting along this surface internal to the material when it's in compression. Now we want to conduct that exact same analysis, but we want to do it for an arbitrary angle. So let's just work through this very quickly. So here I have my, uh, my column in compression. I'm applying a load P and we'll describe the normal and shear force acting along this face, now inclined at an arbitrary angle theta rather than the convenient 45 degrees. Now just for drawing things uh, quickly here, I made this a nice 30 degree using my 30 degree triangle here. So let's draw the force triangle for P, normal force, and shear force. So if I incline my, my little triangle here like this, I can draw a vector along this axis to be P. That one will be in, and the last one will be aligned with the vector V. So there's my force triangle for the vectors P, V, and N. And now when we look at it in this case here, since this is our 90 degree angle right here, we can see that N is just given as P times the cosine of theta. And V is given as P times the sine of theta. So that's the normal force. Now we want to get the stress. And so the stress, remember, we'll get the stress we need to know what the area is of this surface here relative to the cross-sectional area of the column itself. So the area of this surface here is given as the area of the column itself divided by the cosine of theta. And you can kind of work this out and make sure that you believe me, but the easy way to check yourself is if we put in cosine of theta is zero, meaning that the normal vector is pointing that way, and the cosine of zero is one, so we, re we return the right area. And at 90 degrees, that area is gonna get larger and larger and larger. And so when we divide A divided by the cosine of 90 degrees, we get a really large number. So it feels right. So now let's get the stresses. So our normal stress acting on this surface is gonna be nothing than our normal force divided by the area divided by the cosine of theta. And so if we put in our normal force of P cosine theta, then we get the nominal stress in compression of the column itself times the cosine squared of theta. And likewise for the shear stress, we get the following formula. Now, if you remember, you might remember some of your trigonometric identities. Uh, we, we can write different uh, relationships for cosine squared and the cosine theta times the sine theta as follows. So we get the following two results, sigma over two times one plus the cosine of two theta and sigma over two times the sine of two theta. So now let's provide a little bit of graphical interpretation of our result. So here's our result from the last slide on what the normal and shear stresses are at an arbitrarily inclined surface, uh, theta. Here we'll take sigma, the compressive stress in this configuration, just to be 100 for convenience. So let's plug in a few numbers here and see what we get. So when theta is zero degrees, cosine of zero is one, one plus one is two, two divided by two is one. So our normal stress is 100 and our shear stress, sine of zero, is just zero. So the first point we have on our parametric plot that we're gonna create here is right here. So we're going to make a parametric plot here of the normal stress versus the shear stress. Now let's put, put in another point. Let's put in 45 degrees. Well, now we have the cosine of two times 45, so the cosine of 90, which is zero.
and we have the sine of 90 at when theta is equal to 45 degrees. So it's also equal to theta over 2. So I locate the intersection of sigma over 2, 50, 50, and I get a point right there. If we go to 90 degrees, now we have the cosine of 180, which is minus 1. So the normal stress is equal to 0, and the sine of uh, 180 is also 0, so the shear stress is equal to 0. So there we have three points. Now, if we, if we think about it, cosine theta, sine of theta, trace out a circle. So what we really have here are points that if we plugged in a bunch of values of theta, we would see trace out a circle. And so there it is. So now we have a representation of the state of stress as a function of angle. And so what does this mean? So we have a circle where the center of the circle is at 50. And we can see the radius of the circle is 50 because we go to 100 and 0 here. And so what that means is if we draw a line at any angle here, and we go from the center outwards, the radius of this line here is 50. This angle here, I just use my 60 degree triangle. So it means two theta is equal to 60 degrees. So what this means is we take our cube and we rotate it now by 30 degrees. This point here describes the state of stress. So now at this point, when I draw my element tilted at 30 degrees, again, two, there's this factor of two in the angle here. So I tilt my box at 30 degrees and I want to know what's the normal force acting on this face and what's the shear force acting on this face. I just read them off the diagram. So here we see that the normal force is a tad under uh, 80, which makes sense because if you remember the cosine of 60 degrees is one half. So one half of 50, which is my radius, that should be at 75. The shear I read off here looks like it's a little bit above 40. And again, if we wanted to be precise, we could use our uh, calculator. And we would find that the calculator tells us the shear is 43. And now there's forces also exerted on this face once we tilt it. But to find them, we just need to rotate by 90 degrees or 180. So we go to the other side of the circle. and we go to a point over here. And I think you can see by symmetry that this shear stress is gonna to have to be 43 as well. And the normal stress is gonna be 75, but it's gonna be opposite in sign, right? Because this we drew as compressive, this is negative, which means that this force will be tensile and will be 25 units. And so if, now if we want to find the state of stress of any arbitrary angle, no matter how we rotate it, we just move around the circle, draw the point, and then we're able to understand what all the forces are acting on an arbitrary cube of material, regardless of the orientation. So let's generalize the state of stress for any arbitrary orientation of our little element in general. So here I'm calling sigma x the tensile or compressive force in the x direction, sigma y, the tensile compressive force in the y direction, and tau is the shear around it. So let's go through the algorithm and then we'll do an example of what more circle is. And this is just a generalization of exactly what we just saw in the last one. So step one. So step one is to draw an xy coordinate for the normal stress and the shear acting on an element of any arbitrary orientation. Now we're going to plot the point sigma x plus sigma y divided by 2, so the average of those two normal stresses, comma 0, so that just a point on the axis, 
and we're going to take the sign convention that tension is positive, compression is negative. Then we're going to plot the point sigma x tau, so the values on this face, and we're going to use the sign convention that when tau, the shear stress, is counterclockwise, meaning this would be positive because it wants to rotate that element counterclockwise, we use a positive value, clockwise would be a negative value. Next, we're going to plot the point sigma y comma tau, so the values on this surface, using the same sign convention. And here, tau, the shear stress, will always be opposite in sign of what it was in step three. So for example, if I look at this face, we see it wants to rotate uh, counterclockwise. If we look at this face, we see it wants to rotate clockwise. And then finally, we just make a circle where the number that we plotted from step number two is going to be the center and these two points lie along the circle. And that's it, and we're done. So you can only see this by example. So now let's do an example. So let's do an example. This one's a little bit arbitrary, but it'll be uh, nice and representative and show us how easy drawing more circle can be. So here we have a little element where we have a kind of unusual state of stress. So we have tensile stress of 100 units in this direction, compressive stress of minus 40 units in this direction, and shear of 55 units. Now. It's a different story how we, know, how we might know this, but let's just go with it and see what the circle tells us for now. So let's draw our points for our circle. So the first thing is to identify the center. So if remember, the center is the average of these two normal stresses. So 100 and minus 40. So we add those together, we get 60. Divide by two, we get 30. So the center of our circle should be right there. Now we need to draw where this point is, 100 comma 55. Again, tensile is assumed to be positive. Rotating the element counterclockwise is assumed to be positive. So our point's gonna be somewhere out here. So let's find it precisely. So there's 50, so 55 will be right there. And 100 will be right there. So those two lines intersect is that point. Now we go up to this surface and we plot that point. Now here we have a negative 40. So we have to go to this point here and the shear stress along this surface wants to rotate clockwise. So again, it's negative, so down here. And so there's the other point of our circle. Now the last step is to draw the circle. And there it is. There's more circle for this arbitrary state of stress. So what does that mean? Huh? Let's think about this for a second. So let's think about what the radius of our circle is. Which comes out really close to 90. What's this angle here? Well, we could figure it out or we could just measure it with a protractor. Looks like it's pretty close to 40 degrees. So what that means is if I take my little element and I orient it this way, this is the state of stress. 155 acting on this surface. Go to the other side of the circle to get the forces acting on this surface. If I come to this point here, I rotate down 40 degrees, or if you remember two theta, meaning my element rotates 20 degrees. Here's an approximate 20 degree mark, so it means now my element's rotated this way, and the state of stress at this point means we have 120 acting on that face. I go over to the other side of this curve, and remember the, the radius is about 90, so I have about 60 acting this way in compression, so that's negative 60. So these are two important points here because these are orientations that if I take my element, I have a, the, the element is only in a tension or compression, so it's all normal stresses on those surfaces. Another important one is the one up here at the top. So the very top of the circle is where there's maximum shear stress. And here, the maximum shear stress is just the radius of the circle. So that's equal to 90 units. And you can tell for creating more circle, 
which allows us to draw the circle and identify some key points, such as what are the maximum compressive and tensile stresses for an element of, and of what orientation that's gonna be and what the maximum shear stresses are. So in the next video, we'll explain a little bit uh, about why this is important. For now, this is mostly focused on the algorithm. So you can see the nice thing with Moore's circle is it does all of our analysis through drawing rather than through equations. And drawing's more fun than doing equations, uh, most of the time anyway.